to the uh, incredible pleasure to have uh, John Thomas here, who is our speaker today. He's coming from North Carolina State University. And he received his bachelor degree in physics at MIT and also his PhD in physics at MIT in 1979. He uh, joined the physics department at Duke University in 1986 and was named Fritz Munden Distinguished Professor in 2004. And then in 2011, he received the Jesse Deans Awards for research from the Southeast section of his uh, research group to uh, North Carolina State University, where he is right now. And he is currently the John S. Ridley Distinguished Professor in Physics. He's a, a fellow of the American Physical Society, a member of the Optical Society of America, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in 2018, he uh, received the APS Davison Gamma Prize for his research on unitary formic acids. So um, John Thomas, actually, I know him since many, many years because he's very well known for his pioneering experiments with degenerate formic acids. And he has got a whole series of beautiful experiments, which essentially everybody in the field knows about. Experiments in the areas, experiments on the BCS, BEC crossover, um, very famously the connections to quark gluon plasmas as well, and the minimum viscosity hypothesis. So he's one of the one of the two pioneers in the fields, and so we are really happy to have him here. And it's always a joy to, uh, it's always a joy to listen to his very lively talks. So please, John Thomas. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Peter. All right, so let me uh, tell you what I'm gonna tell you about. So I have actually two experiments that I wanna talk about today. So I used a rather broad title on optically trapped Fermi gases. And so before I start, I just wanna mention that I've been fortunate to have a lot of good postdocs and research scholars. The guys with the red stars have gone on to junior pastures. Ilya has been with me a, a long time and. Uh, fortunately wants to stay in the area, so I'm, I'm lucky to have him. I've had a bunch of great grad students. The most recent is Saeed Pegahan, who uh, actually did the work I'm going to tell you about on the weekly interacting gases, and he just finished his PhD uh, in December. He defended. Um, and finally, we, we take money from anybody who has it, uh, and so over the years, we, we've been funded by these uh, four agencies. So let me start out. Um, is telling you a little bit about what I'm going to tell you. And so the big picture is Fermi gases have widely uh, tunable interactions. And so we can vary the interaction strength. We did quite a bit of work in the very strongly interacting regime at the top of the scale here. And there we created a strongly interacting Fermi gas, which has this strange property that if you release it from a cigar-shaped optical trap, after a couple of milliseconds, it expands into an ellipse. So it turns from a cigar into an ellipse. And that's due to the pressure gradients being larger in the narrow direction than in the long direction. And it turns out this type of flow is called elliptic flow. And in our Fermi gas, we're observing it at about 100 nano Kelvin temperatures. But now once you have strongly interacting fermions, which are spin up and spin down atoms, of course, you can simulate a lot of other things like high temperature superconductors, the crust of neutron stars, and as uh, Peter mentioned, the quark gluon plasma turned out to be an important connection to verify that a quark gluon plasma exists. The people in that field originally looked for elliptic flow in momentum space. And they're the people who coined that term and wrote to us shortly after our paper on strongly interacting gases came out. Now, it turns out that if you work on a quark gluon plasma and a strongly interacting Fermi gas, you discover that they both flow with extremely low viscosity. And it turns out then you attract some interest from the conformal field theory community, because it turns out they've, they've constructed some theorems on uh, minimum viscosity hydrodynamics, which turn out to be of interest. And so we've done a lot of things with the strongly interacting gas. And for the first part of the talk, I kind of want to tell you where we are in studying hydrodynamic transport in that system. But in the second part of the talk, we're going to turn the interaction strength all the way to the other end, as weakly as we can make it. And it turns out about 10 years ago, we, we did some work on weakly interacting Fermi gases, and we discovered that they naturally make spin waves, which at the time we didn't fully understand. And so I'm gonna tell you some more about that, but it turns out what we've discovered recently is that this weakly interacting system is a nice system potentially for studying information scrambling. 
And so I've got a, a kind of artistic picture here of a black hole, which is supposedly the best information scrambler. And I've warned my students not to make a black hole because they might fall into it and never graduate. So we'll have to be a little, uh, a little careful. So what I do first is just remind you where the tunable interactions come from. And this is the good old Feshbach resonance in lithium-6. Then I want to briefly mention the, where, where we're at in, in studying universal shear viscosity in the expanding clouds and our most recent experiments looking at linear hydrodynamics where we begin to get a handle on the thermal conductivity. Um, then I'm going to switch gears, completely changing topics, go to the weakly interacting regime, and I want to show you how that creates an energy space lattice with long range effective interactions and how this might be an interesting system for studying uh, information scrambling. So let me go forward with this. So again, the, the atom we study is uh, lithium-6, and it has just one valence electron and a nuclear spin of one. So it is a fermion. There are six hyperfine states, and in a high magnetic field, three of the states will tune down and three will tune up. And the three that tune down are the ones that interest us. Their electron spin points downward. They simply have a different nuclear spin projection. And so the lowest state, one here, has a net spin of a half. That's our spin up state and spin two is our spin down state. But again, both states have electron spin down. What that means then is we work with these two states. When those states collide, they will collide in the triplet diatomic potential because their electron spins are parallel, even though the atom spins are not. And so they'll collide in a rather simple way. But of course, lithium has a singlet potential, which has some high-lying vibrational states. And what that means is if we tune the magnetic field just right, we can tune the total energy of a colliding pair into resonance with the highest lying bound state. And when we do that, we get a collisional resonance. And it's just due to the hyperfine coupling between the singlet and triplet potentials. And that's really the workhorse in this field. So this allows us to tune the S wave scattering life widely. And the resonant place I was just talking about at 832 Gauss um, formally tunes the S wave scattering life to zero energy scattering life to infinity, but there's another region where we can tune the S wave scattering length essentially to zero and have a very weakly interacting system. In the weakly interacting regime, the collision cross section would just be four pi A squared. This is just S wave scattering. But if we tune A to infinity, we hit the unitary limit where the natural scale of length becomes the de Broglie wavelength of the colliding particles. And in that case, the de Broglie wavelength is actually the only length scale in the system the details of the collision parameters are, all disappear. And so we have these two extreme regimes, and I want to talk a little about each of them. And so I'm going to start the talk off with this unitary regime. And so I can't resist showing this picture, which is actually due to Mike Game's sister-in-law. This is my classic picture of a CO2 laser trap. So we have a focused CO2 laser beam. We just make a cigar-shaped optical trap that the atoms are attracted to, and we trap nominally some mixture of spin up and spin down lithium six atoms. And then we have these magnet coils for tuning the scattering length, which I mentioned. And then what this really looks like, these white housings here are the magnet coils that are water cooled. We have zinc selenide lens and zinc selenide windows for the CO2 laser beam, which is 10 micron wavelength. We have ordinary optics for the red light, 670 nanometers, which is the resonant frequency for the lithium six atom. And so that's what we do uh, for our basic setup. So what I want to talk a little bit about now is some of these ideas of universal hydrodynamic transport and the state of our measurements. So simple thing I want to talk about first is just shear viscosity. And so if I have two plates that are separated, say, with some air between them, and I move the lower plate with respect to the upper plate at constant velocity, I have to apply a certain force per unit area to do that. And so the question I have for you is, What's the dimension of shear viscosity such that the velocity gradient times the shear viscosity gives the force per unit area that I need? And so if you look at that for a second, you realize the velocity gradient has dimensions of one over time. And so to get a force per unit area, the shear viscosity has to have a dimension of momentum over area. And in the unitary gas, the natural unit of momentum is just h bar over the de Broglie wavelength. The natural unit of cross section is the square of the de Broglie wavelength. And so we end up with something that's dimensionally h bar over the de Broglie wavelength cubed. 
which at high temperature scales as temperature to the three halves, but at low temperature, the de Broglie wavelength in a Fermi gas will become nominally the inner particle spacing. And so the shear viscosity will turn into just H bar uh, times the density. And so let me just take a quick look. So you guys are chatting here. I wanna make sure I don't, have I missed anything? Uh, no. no. So we're good, okay. Um, so the natural unit of the shear viscosity can always be written as just Planck's constant times the density. And you notice it's always a quantum property. You can't even write it down without an H bar. So now it turns out, if we go back to about 2007, Garrett Brun and, and Hank Smith did a beautiful calculation in the high temperature limit. And what they showed was in that limit, the shear viscosity scales as temperature to the three halves, as I told you. And they're able to calculate this coefficient in, in closed form. And you see this very beautiful property that this formula has no collision properties in it. It only has the mass of the colliding atoms in it. And that's it. Other than that, it's completely fundamental. And similarly, you can do a calculation of the thermal conductivity. This is a little more recent. It was first done uh, by my, my colleague, Thomas Schaefer. And the relative size of these things can be written as 15 fourths KB over M. And so you again see that we have a universal property that has no details of the collision physics or properties of the atoms in it. Everything is fundamental constants. And so the question is, can you actually measure these things and see this stuff happen? Um, it turns out not to be so easy. And so how do you measure the shear viscosity? In our first crack, we look at the expansion hydrodynamics. And it's particularly nice if we use two cameras because we can let the cloud expand and measure its size in all three directions. And so we actually choose a cloud that's a flattened cigar with a three to one transverse ratio. And in our most recent experiments, we look at the transverse expansion and observe elliptic flow in it. And when we do that, what you see is that the X size starts out small, the Y size starts out big. So the aspect ratio starts out small and then grows. And on these top curves, we're looking at the resonant case where we've tuned right to this collisional resonance unitary regime. And in this case, I'm plotting the aspect ratio for different energies of the gas. And this is energy per particle in units of the ideal gas Fermi energy. When this number is 0.48, we would be at the absolute T equals zero ground state. And so this is essentially a pure superfluid on the top, the blue curve. But then as we raise the energy, 0.75 is already above the superfluid transition. So these lower curves are uh, normal, fluid, uh, uh, normal fluid gases. Um, if we look at this lower curve here, the very lowest, that's the ballistic case. We've tuned actually to the zero crossing. And here we can fit this curve using just the known trap parameters, no free parameters. And we see that it works correctly. But to fit the top curves, we need a theory of the expansion. And it turns out we can do that using only the average shear viscosity as a free parameter. And it's an average because the density in the cloud is not a constant. And so we're averaging over the cloud density. The important thing to see here is that this is energy dependent. And so it means that the shear viscosity turns out to be energy dependent. And we can plot it, we can plot the shear viscosity in units of h bar n as a function of the energy per particle. And so we, we first did that back in 2011. And what we see here is that uh, actually a rather deep trap, 50 times as deep as our, the trap down here, actually all fits on a single curve. And in the high temperature limit, you can show it is scaling essentially as t to the three halves. And I'll show you that more later. But this blue data is actually much newer it comes from 2015. And so this is our best cloud average data. And now I've swindled you and changed scales. And the scale I'm using is actually the reduced temperature at the center of the cloud. So TF is the Fermi energy at the cloud center and T is the, is the absolute temperature. And what you see here uh, is an interesting thing that in this region, there's a transition to a superfluid. And we notice that the shear viscosity starts to drop and Martin Zwierlein, who actually did the beautiful work on measuring the equation of state of this thing, assures me that this cannot be, but we keep seeing it. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to see about that. So it turns out my, my friend Thomas realized we can cure this problem of measuring an average shear viscosity and actually pull out a local shear viscosity by doing a little more complicated model. And so what he realized is that first we should expand 
the sheer viscosity, what he likes to call the diluteness, which is the product of the density and the cube of the de Broglie wavelength. And so we have these parameters. And, but then now he's going to fit the cloud with full 3D hydro, but he uses second order hydrodynamics, which means basically he has a model that can extrapolate from the perfect hydro in the middle of the dense cloud to the ballistic region at the cloud edges. And it's basically because it knows how to extrapolate to the Boltzmann equation limit. And so it does the hydro and extrapolates all the way to the low density region at the edges, does this correctly. And he, he starts from our raw data and fits it, and he pulls out these parameters. And so he's able to get these guys out. But now I show this to you and you might say, well, so what? Why do I care about these parameters? But now let's go back to the calculation I mentioned to you. What should this eta not be? Because it's the high temperature limit. According to Bernard Smith, it should be 15 over 32 root pi, which happily is 0.264. So you notice the agreement is spectacular. But right now, so I'm really happy about this. This is the first time we've ever actually seen this. But there's another parameter. I don't know if anybody knows how to calculate that. So John Thomas, which is me, tried. And I used a hand-waving polyblocking method. I get a number that's four times this big. I talked to Thomas. He said, yeah, he looked at that too. Um, so you really have to take into account that this is a strongly interacting gas. Nobody knows how to calculate this. Would be nice to see it in this form. So we got a little tired of playing with these traps that have varying density and decided it would be nice to use a box potential. And so we started using digital micro mirror device to to make traps of any shape we want. And when the students were just playing with this, they decided it would be fun to make a triangle trap, a star trap, and my favorite is a smiley face trap. And so they did this when they first built the apparatus, they were just playing games. But then we got serious and we do a little more careful box. And then we start getting profiles that look a little more like a box potential and we get reasonably smooth density. And so once we created this system, we realized this might be useful for getting at not only the shear viscosity, but also the thermal conductivity. These are both fundamental universal quantities. Be nice to actually see if they come out right. So I mentioned the shear viscosity, which we just looked at. And in the beginning of the talk, I talked about the thermal conductivity. The question is, can we get at the thermal conductivity? And so we go back to a freshman calculation. I give you a cube of material with a uniform temperature plus some periodic small perturbation to the temperature, how long does it take the perturbation to die out? And so we can just look at the rate of change of the en energy density, which depends on the heat current. And then if we just put in that the rate of change of the en energy density depends on the heat capacity per unit volume and the rate of change of temperature, we quickly derive a decay rate equation, um, which tells us that the amplitude epsilon here decays exponentially. And it decays at a rate that depends on the uh, the uh, wave vector of this perturbation, and most important, the thermal conductivity. And so how are we going to get at that in our experiments? We use our um, micromirror array to make a periodic optical potential with a given wavelength, say 25 microns, that we can translate into the box at a controllable speed. Now, if we vary the speed, we're actually varying the effective frequency of this wave. And so we have independent control of the wavelength and the frequency just by varying the speed. Now, what does that gain us? What it means is that for a given Q value, for a given wavelength, if the frequency is large, the temperature can't relax. There's no heat flow. And we end up actually in the adiabatic regime. And so the response is governed by the adiabatic sound speed, C naught. But if our frequency is low compared to this temperature relaxation rate, the temperature tends to stay constant across the sample. And we end up looking at a response that's governed by the isothermal sound speed. And so in doing this, in making this transition, how this happens is governed by this thermal conductivity. And so to give you an idea of what this potential looks like, we have just a movie taken on a larger scale. So this is what the DMD array can do. It's kind of fun. We make all these funny potentials. And so the idea is to translate that into the box and see what we get. And so we translate it into the box a certain distance, not hitting the far side of the box. Let me get some funny response that looks like this. 
And the game is, can we understand this and extract hydroparameters? And so we need an equation for the density response and we use a linear regime. And in, in doing this, the response of the density, the, the leading term comes from the pressure. Um, but then additionally, we have this perturbing force, which is that little periodic potential that we're translating into the box. But we have to remember there's also a box potential and it's important to include that. And so we have all these pieces and then we have viscous forces that go at n dot. To solve these equations, we need an equation for the entropy response as well. And it has a simple form, looks like this. What happens is when the frequency is low, delta S dot is zero, then this delta S1 here is the negative of this quantity, which if you plug it back in here, the one cancels the delta N and the remaining CV over CP turns the C naught squared into a CT squared. And so what happens is, depending on where we are and how what our frequency is, we're interpolating between the adiabatic sound velocity and the isothermal. And so that's really what this uh, thermal conductivity is governing. And so let's take a look at that. And before we can use that equation, we have to actually figure out what the box potential is. So we take a typical cloud shape, in this case for a larger cloud than the one I just showed, and we simply use force balance in the box potential the pressure forces balance the box potential forces. And using that, we can actually solve for the uh, box potential force. And then integrating that, we get the box potential. So from this data and this red curve fit, we get this box potential in units of the Fermi energy. And that we can then use in our model. So let's see how well the model does. So one of the parameters we fit is actually the sound speed. We also measure it separately. And from the sound speed in the equation of state, we actually know the reduced temperature T over TF at the, uh, of the cloud. And then we can use Thomas's results for the uh, shear viscosity. Um, and so we know it for this particular temperature. We start out with a wavelength of 19 microns for our perturbation, which gives us a thermal relaxation rate of about 760 hertz. And so this is typical data that we get. We're varying the speed from 0.4 of the speed of sound to 0.9 of the speed of sound. And we look at how the model does and we see, yep, fits pretty well. We can do pretty well with this. We can also go do a longer wavelength. And so we do one more 30 microns instead of 19. And we look at those guys and we look at how the fits come out. And so we can see the model does pretty well. And so from this model, what we find is that to, to fit all the data I showed you together, we need a thermal conductivity that's about 15% bigger than our, than our calculation. And it, it's completely consistent within our ability to measure it. Um, and so that's where we are with this. What we haven't yet done is extract the thermal conductivity and the shear viscosity independently. And that's what we're working on. And so we have this beautiful technique that reduces the averaging over the density. We believe in our current experiments, we're going to be able to independently extract the transport properties for the first time. And we're going to be able to do it as a function of temperature over a reasonable range. And then there's a mess of things to do. Um, Michael was just mentioning that he's interested in turbulence. And indeed, that's something we can play with with this system by controlling what we, the speed with which we translate this perturbation uh, into the cloud. So I could stop here for a second and ask, are there questions on the hydro part of my talk? I realize I'm talking pretty fast because I want to tell you about the weakly interacting gases. So are you guys with me? Yes. 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 So you're okay, so I should just go on. You still I'll alive? Ask, I'll ask in the end. Okay, sounds good. So the weekly interacting gas work is actually quite new, and I I, I mentioned to uh, Peter at the beginning uh, about, about an hour ago. We just got noticed literally an hour and a half ago that our FISREV letter on this was accepted. So this is pretty new work, and so we'll see if you like it. And here we go. So the first thing I want to talk about is if you have a weakly interacting gas, you naturally create an energy space lattice and a harmonic trap. And I want to talk about how that works. So we have our focused CO2 laser beam now. We're back to that. We're not using the box. And in the cigar-shaped trap, the atoms have a low frequency oscillation in the long direction at 23 hertz. And non-interacting atoms oscillated 625 hertz in the, in the narrow radial direction. And we put about 65,000 atoms in this thing. And if you work out the parameters for this, 
the Fermi energy in the harmonic trap, or the Fermi temperature is 0.7 microkelvin. The reduced temperature is about 0.3. And we occupy about 650 quantum states in the long direction. That's the maximum number. We also have some S-wave scattering interaction, but this time, instead of tuning the A to infinity, we're tuning it almost to zero. We move away from zero by just a little bit, about a Gauss, and we get about 4.2 Bohr as our scattering length. And associated with that scattering length is an S-wave scattering cross-section from which we can calculate, if we want, a classical collision rate. And we see that the classical collision rate is extremely small. It's one per 1,000 seconds. And in fact, anybody who knows about Fermi gases knows there's also Pauli blocking. And so the actual rate is even smaller than this. And so we're assured that the gas is essentially collisionless over the one second time scales that we use for our experiments. But there's also negligible coupling between the harmonic oscillator states due to this perturbation. And if you work out the coupling between the states of relative motion, and I don't want to tell you a lot of detail right now, which you discover is they scale like 10 to minus four over the quantum number, which can be order of a couple of hundred quantum numbers squared to the one fourth. So the upshot is this is down by at least another factor of 10. So the coupling between energy states is 10 to the minus five of this frequency. There's no coupling. So what does that mean? It means the energy states are essentially conserved, even though there's a small interaction. And so in a harmonic trap relative to the ground state, if we just write the energies in terms of the harmonic oscillator energies, I mean the harmonic, oscill yeah, the harmonic oscillator quantums, you see that we have a lattice in n space, and x and y and z, and the atoms remain in these sites. They never leave. And now with an RF pulse, we can create a spin superposition state for each atom. And so we can put a spin on every one of these sites, creating a spin lattice. Now, this would be totally boring if there was no interaction between the spins, but it turns out there's an effective long-range interaction that comes from the mean field, which is linear in the scattering length and actually makes an important contribution. And so this is what we mean by an energy lattice. The energy is conserved, the atoms live in their respective energy sites forever for the purposes of our experiment. So now how do we get a coupling? Well, we got to look back for a second at a two atom collision. And remember we have two different spins for atom one and atom two. So we have a total spin but only the singlet spin can actually collide. The atoms have to be in a symmetric spatial state to interact by short range potential. So they have to be in a singlet spin state. And so our interaction really should have a singlet spin projection operator in it. And so we modify our interaction just a little bit from the four pi h bar squared result that I gave you before. We add the spin projection operator, which is exactly a half if a spin up and a spin down atom collide which turns us back into the interaction I wrote down before. But this is now the effective exchange interaction that we have because triplet states don't collide and singlet states do. So it's as if they have two different interactions. If we work out the Heisenberg equations for this, what we see is that when two spins collide, the spins will rotate about their resultant total. And so there's gonna be a rotation of the spin vectors, but of course they're individually conserved in length and the total is conserved. So now what happens with this? How do you get an interaction? Well, all you have to do is take the expectation value of this perturbation with the single atom densities. So if we have two atoms collide, we need to take the expectation value of this with the product of the densities for E1 and E2. If we do that, we get an effective interaction coming from this S1.S2 that looks like the spin of atom of E1 with energy E1 dotted into the spin of atom with energy E2. And the scattering length is here from before. And what's this G? It's just the overlap of these densities for the two different energies we've selected. And we're doing this in a one-dimensional approximation. We're assuming tight radial confinement, so there's just an effective average density. But now we can make a WKB approximation because we're working with large quantum numbers. If you do that, this blue integral can actually be done in closed form. And the important thing is it scales like one over the square root of the energy difference. And so that's a really long range coupling, but the coupling is in energy space. And so we have a system that has a spin lattice with long range coupling. So that's kind of neat. Now we can switch and build a many body Hamiltonian just by summing up all the individual two, two body interactions, put a factor of two in to keep from counting twice and that's it. So that's our interaction.
But there's one more piece I need to tell you about. The magnetic field we apply has some curvature and it's pretty much unavoidable in the system we have. And that creates a little bit of a magnetic bowl for the atoms. And so we have our spin one, our spin up atoms oscillating in this magnetic bowl. And we have our spin two atoms interacting or spin down atoms interacting in this magnetic bowl, uh, oscillating in this magnetic bowl. And so now what frequency did they oscillate at? Well, to a very good approximation, they both oscillate at 23 Hertz, which is what I told you before, but the spins have slightly different magnetic moments. And so in this magnetic bowl, they have a slight difference in frequency. It turns out to be about 15 millihertz. And you might think that will do nothing, but if you apply an RF field and put in a pulse to excite the atoms to a very good approximation, the bowls are the same, so we can't change the n quantum number. The Frank Condon factor is zero for a change in n. So we go from n to n, but the n, remember, can be several hundred. And when you have several hundred, if the oscillation frequency differs by 15 millihertz, you start picking up a good fraction of a hertz or a hertz, and that matters. And so we end up with a resonance frequency shift when we're going to do the experiment on its time scale of a second um, that actually matters. And we introduce, as well, a global detuning we can't control things perfectly, so we can make a hertz or a fraction of a hertz error in our frequency. And in addition, there's this energy dependent part. So the upshot is there's an energy dependent tuning. And what does that do? It means that if you put in a pi over two pulse and excite a spin up atom of energy E into the superposition state of uh, one over the square root of two of up plus down, at t equals zero, it will be x polarized. But as time evolves, that spin will rotate in the xy plane. And that's an effect we need to take into account. And so we have two pieces in this. So we start out with all the atoms pointing downward. We hit it with a pi over two pulse, put, the, put all the atoms in the xy plane. But if we wait a while, what happens is this rotation effect creates an effect of Zeeman interaction. And it looks like this when we do the Heisenberg equations of motion. So atoms of different energies rotate by different amounts. In the simplest picture, a higher energy atom rotates more than a lower energy atom. But we also have this long range interaction that I mentioned, and it just creates another rotation. Only this rotation is a little more complicated. The part of the atom of energy E is being rotated by all the other atoms of all other energies. And we can look a little bit about what that does. So if you look at a, an atom of energy E2, colliding with an atom of energy E3 or E1, you see that E2 cross E1 will cause E1 to go downward, whereas E2 cross E3 will cause E3 to go upward. And so the upshot is this interaction term tends to rotate the spins out of the xy plane. And what that does is it creates a spin wave that you can observe because it's in the z direction. Um, but the spin wave is actually an energy space. And it can be observed in real space because of course the energy has, the energy space has a con consequence for the real space. So how do we do the experiments? We start out with our bias coils. We tune them to a field where we have the four Bohr scattering length. We have our little CO2 laser trap. And then we introduce this RF coil, which is what we use for this pi over two pulse I mentioned. It's at 76 megahertz nominally. We use a stable pulse generator, has a tenth of a hertz res uh, resolution, and actually very good stability over many seconds. Um, we have a phase shifter. When the phase shifter is at zero, we define our pulse to be about the y-axis, but we can put in a 90-degree phase shift, which allows us to rotate about the x-axis relative to the first pulse. And so this is how we do phase-controlled, uh, axis-controlled rotations. And finally, we have a set of secondary coils, which are just a few winds of copper wire around the main coils. That allows us to tune the magnetic field by just a couple of gauss with a couple of amps. And that is our fast control of the scattering length. And so that's the basic setup. So the simplest thing you can do is create a spin wave. So you start out with all the atoms pointing down. And then you hit them with that pi over two pulse and they point in the x direction, at least what we define to be the x direction. And so this is our initial state after this half millisecond pulse. But then we let the atoms evolve for eight tenths of a second in the Hamiltonian. And then we take a picture of the spin up state and the spin down state, which are easy to resolve because the optical frequency difference is 76 megahertz. And so we take those two pictures very quickly before anything changes. And what do we see? Well, right after we put in the initial 
pi over two pulse, we're in exactly a 50-50 superposition state. So if we measure the N1 state or the N2 state, we get identical uh, spatial profiles. If we subtract the two, we get zero. If we add the two, we get a Thomas Fermi profile. And so that's nice. But now we wait eight tenths of a second and something funny happens. The N1 state has moved in and the N2 state has moved out. If we take the difference, we see it's no longer zero. But if we add the two, the two spins together, we get the same pattern as if nothing happened. This is again a consequence of energy conservation. The particles are not changing their energies. They're simply changing their spin. And so now we have this simple model. We believe we understand what's going on in energy space. How do we get into real space? Well, there's no energy space coherence because there's no coupling between the energy states. And what that means then is the real space and the energy space are related just by the simple integral. We know the wave function for each energy. And the question is how well does this simple approximation work? And so we do this experiment and we fit the model to the data. And here there's no free parameters. We, we vary the sigma maybe just a couple of percent. And you see the fit is to say the least very good. So the simple model works quite well. So that makes us happy. Everything kind of does what it should do. So now we can actually do a little more. We actually measure the scattering length by looking at how the central spin density varies in time. And I don't want to tell you this in detail. We just fit the scattering length here using our model and we get a linear uh, curve or a linear profile. And it allows us then to figure out how the scattering length tunes. And we can compare it with a couple channels model, which is actually due to Paul Julian. And we see that the number we get is completely consistent. And so we're able to use this as the calibration for our model fits. And everything seems to work nicely with that. So we published a paper on that a while ago, just detailing this, all this calibration stuff and how our basic model works. But now I want to look at a little more complicated structure. And here I'm using scattering lengths that are a little bit bigger and both signs. And you see, even with this more complicated structure, we're getting everything to look pretty good. And so it seems like we know what we're doing. So the question is, can we actually observe the spin vectors in energy space instead of in real space? Because that's really where all the action is happening anyway. And the energy is conserved, whereas the physical space position of the atoms, of course, is not conserved. So let's see if we can actually see the energy space uh, spin vector directly. How do we do that? What we realize is that it, for, for our conditions, WKB approximation is a good one. So we can write the square of the wave function as essentially one over the velocity, but we can also write that in terms of a delta function. And it's just convenient because then we can do the energy integral trivially. And when we do that, what we see is that we get a quasi-classical description of the energy. And so we simply have to integrate over the momentum uh, for the SE in energy space to get the SE in position space. But this is exactly an able transform of S of E. And so we can find S Z of E by doing the inverse able transform of S of S X. And so we can actually find S Z of E from the spatial profile. So we decided to try doing that. And so here we took a pretty complicated energy space profile, which comes from a, pro a protocol that I'll tell you about. And we inverse able transform it and we get this profile in energy space. And when we did this, we worried a little, do we have enough resolution in energy space? So we transform it back and we get this red curve, which you see pretty well fits the spin density that we started with. So we think we know what we're doing and we think we know how to observe the spin waves in energy space. So now this leads us to an interesting place. We have this energy space spin lattice. Can we use it to study information scrambling? And we realize this might be a nice thing because we have a really big lattice, 65,000 atoms. Can we start to study information scrambling in a quasi-classical regime, lots and lots of spins? And we figured that would be a good thing. But the trouble is you have to know how to quantify information scrambling. And it turns out one of the ways is by measuring what's called an out of time order correlation function. And here we're inspired by Anna, Anna Maria Ray's group. They've done a lot of beautiful theory on this stuff. And so we got interested in this. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how it works. So I hope I'm not running too long. Am I doing okay for time? Like, is it tomorrow yet? I'm not sure I don't have my watch on. So- Not we, quite, but it, we're, you, we're getting close, but- Okay, because okay. I have about like, probably I need about 15 minutes. We'll see, I'll go fast. So the basic idea is if we're gonna measure 
Um, if we want to, if we, well, let me, let me step back. We have two operators that are both unitary and we can just simply apply them in opposite order to some initial state. And then we can look at the overlap of psi one and psi two. So the only difference between these two states is the order in which these operators are applied. And it turns out this is a standard form for an out of time order correlation function. It would be time ordered if the W dagger were in the middle. And what one can show with just some very simple algebra is that the square of the commutator of W and V can be related to the real part of this, of this quantity. So if you can measure this, you can look at how this commutator changes in time. And we will generally choose the two operators to commute initially at time t equals zero. And so what this does for us is it provides an estimate of how two operators, which initially commute in a many body system, fail to commute at a later time. And that provides a measure of information scrambling. And it also defines a scrambling time. And so the game is how do we configure an experiment that actually does this? And so we wanna have a V operator that's indeed Hermitian and we're not gonna be able to measure it. And it's gonna be convenient to choose it so the initial state psi naught is an eigenstate of it with an eigenvalue one, which will get rid of this guy. And what that does is it means the thing we wanna measure looks like the expectation value of a Hermitian operator with respect to the state W psi. So now as experimentalists, if we can choose V and W intelligently, we can do the measurement. So for us, the initial state is gonna be that X polarized state that I mentioned. But if we choose V to be twice the spin operator for any one atom, since the spin up here is always a half, V hitting this state is always one times the state and we satisfy this condition. So we know what V is, but now I gotta tell you about how we get W. And it turns out it's gonna be convenient in the experiments to be able to run time backwards. We wanna be able to reverse the time. And we actually first did this a long time ago, um, but not for this purpose. And so how do you reverse time? You gotta make the Hamiltonian change sign. If you put a pi pulse in this system, you can change the sign to the spin, which will reverse this term, but it leaves this term unchanged. But you can also change the sign of the scattering light. And so if you do both, you win. So the protocol you use looks like this. If you ignore this red phi for a second, we create the initial state that's X polarized. We run time forward for two tenths of a second. The pi pulse and reversing A reverses the Hamiltonian, runs time backwards, which we create essentially the initial state. And we probe that initial state with the final pi over two pulse. And so if we didn't have the phi, this would just run time forward and backwards. But now we introduce this extra rotation and I'll show you what it does in a second. It screws everything up in an interesting way. The total state of the system is this complicated mess, but I can clean this thing up in a simple way. I, I can end up getting this little chunk here, which you will recognize is the rotated Hamiltonian that I need. You clean it up just a little more and it looks like this. And so we have the initial state created by this first pulse. Then we have this operator, which is gonna take us forward in time. And then we just have this little extra rotation and all we can measure in our experiment is actually the Z component of the spin, because we can only measure directly the spin up and spin down states with our camera. When you take the expectation value of SZ, this guy, three pi over two rotation turns SZ into SX. And so we're actually gonna be measuring this. And if you look at the structure, it is of exactly the form that I told you I wanted. And so that's good. And so here's our protocol and what we're gonna do is we're simply going to run forward with for two tenths of a second with one scattering length, and then we're going to reverse it for two tenths of a second. And we're going to put on a pi, pi pulse and do this rotation. And presto bingo, we're going to measure the output. OK, so that's just fine and dandy. The only thing is, how does it work? So here is the, uh, again, our funny model. Here's the profile that we get for the case where phi equals pi. So we're running this complicated profile. Here's the sum of the two densities, again, returning back to the Thomas Fermi form showing the energy is conserved. The red is our, is our theoretical model. Slight problem is our model now requires about two and a half times the measured scattering length to get this rapidly varying structure. And we don't know why, but now we can do a little more. Let's measure the mean square commutator. And I told you we could measure this quantity. I don't wanna go into too much detail, but the important idea is we're gonna be measuring just this SZ and it's gonna tell us about this mean square commutator. But the result I've written is for just one span of one single energy. In our experiment, we're gonna sum it over some finite range of energy. We have finite resolution. And when we do that, we're actually gonna be measuring 
this quantity. And in terms of our able transforms from the spatial profiles of n up and n down, we get the energy profiles. And so we measure this quantity. The numerator over two is SZ and the denominator is this number of spins that have energy E. And so this is what we wanna measure. We can also measure it with no energy resolution. Look at the total number of atoms in spin up and spin down. And this is the same sort of quantity, but it has no energy resolution. And so the question is, how do these quantities depend on phi? And it turns out they depend on phi in an interesting way. Uh, you can expand the phi dependence generally this way. That's kind of obvious. What's less obvious is when you do this, the M here actually has a physical meaning. It's the difference of the projections of the total angular momentum of the gas onto the x-axis. And of course, in this type of system, there's many different angular momentum states. It turns out there's an effect of detuning that I don't want to talk about most much, but all it does is it, if you have a finite detuning, which I mentioned, it rotates the axis. So we're not really making our measurement about the x-axis, but about a slightly rotated axis. Turns out not to hurt us, doesn't change the structure, just averages the coefficients. And so the upshot is we do a fit with a set of parameters that looks like this. Our goal is extract the magnitudes of these B coefficients and these phases, and let's see what happens. And so we go in and do this. First time we do just the total numbers. So we're gonna measure this quantity and see how it looks. And there it is. So when you measure this quantity as a function of phi, when the phi is zero, we, we end up with uh, exactly a half. And so what ends up happening, you should be here. We're not quite there, we know why, but we get this shape and we can fit it with this. And it gives us a distribution of these coherence coefficients telling us we're seeing delta M's as big as around four. But now we can see, well, does our, does our mean field model or the spin vector model fit this at all? Well, if we use the measured scattering length, we get the red, uh, the black dash curve, which is definitely not the right thing. But if we increase the amplitude of the scattering length by 2.6, we get the red curve, which looks a lot better. So we say, okay, it's kind of a lot like the spatial profile I showed you. I need a bigger coefficient. We don't know why, and that's okay. Um, tells us we're not totally crazy. But now let's look at the case where we have energy resolution. When we do that, we notice we have our energy resolution of about 0.04 EF, where EF is the Fermi energy. And so we look at all these different energies and we see the structures are quite different. And so we do a different fit for each one of these guys and we extract the corresponding coefficients. And you see the higher energy has a flatter distribution than, than low energy, or for at least in the intermediate energies, you know, God knows. Um, and then we again try our mean field model, which is down here. And we see that we can capture pretty well the shapes of all these complicated things, but we need to tweak the detuning at the level of about a Hertz. And that's because when we're doing six shots for each of these things, we don't have perfect control of detuning. So our experimental detuning is a little bit imperfect. And so we need to tweak the model. So the thing we don't understand is this factor 2.6, but the shapes fit pretty well. So this is where we are so far. And then I will stop. Um, and so we have this beautiful spin lattice with effective long range interactions. And we've now demonstrated that we can actually do these out of time correlation measurements with energy resolution. And our hope, and probably the most interesting thing we wanna do now is to look at correlations between different energy sectors and see how they evolve in time. And so we think those things can be directly measured with this energy resolve technique. And so we're excited about that. So finally, I wanna stop and just show you my students and so this is Ching Yun and Khan, this is Ching Yun and Khan and Ilya, who did a beautiful experiment on pairing and optical super lattices that I didn't talk about. And Ilya and Saeed did the experiment I just described on weakly interacting gases. And then here's Arun and Nithya, who were my first husband and wife team. Um, they did a fantastic job on experiments on optical control of interactions, which I didn't talk about. Ethan and James are really the pioneers in our quantum hydrodynamics experiments. But the recent experiments that I just talked about were done by my postdocs, Stetson, Lauren, and Shin. Um, and Shin is the one continuing with our, our latest experiments on the box potential and linear hydro. And finally, I can't give a talk that, that mentions hydro without mentioning my December 2010 celebration. So when I was 60, my students decided to throw me a birthday party. And they got a special cake baked at the Mad Hatter in Durham. And so here's the cake. And you notice it's not your average cake. Uh, it's an elliptic flow birthday cake. So with that, I will stop. I probably talked a little too much and a little too fast at the end, but um, I appreciate you all listening. <laughs>
So that's where I am. Awesome. Very nice. Big round of applause. Thank you very much, John, for a fantastic Thank you. talk. Yeah, yes, indeed. Yes, yeah, so I covered a lot, and uh, we will hopefully uh, make some more progress. Yeah, so we've got some time for questions from the audience. All right. Works for me. So what, what, let me see, actually, let me see what time it is. I, I, oh, man, so I'm not too bad. Okay. Oh, you're just on time. Yeah, so I, I didn't want to go in too much detail on this on the information scrambling because it gets to be a little too much mathematics that I have to put up. Um, so that's good. Okay. So what you guys got? Question for your first part of your talk. How cold are you in the box? So in these particular so experiments, relatively warm, we wanted to actually be in the higher temperature region. Uh, being sure to be not super fluid. So we're actually mm -hmm. here about 0.5. How cold can you go? So uh, Shin just got down a little below 0.2. And so we, we've we been avoiding super fluid regime for a little while because there's an extra bulk viscosity in there and, and some things that we know how to write the equations and I've written them, but we, we want to play with the above super fluid transition for a little while. Uh, and then indeed we will try to get it down to more like a 10th for the T over TF. Um, it's okay. not completely trivial because you have to do an excellent job on the evaporation and then manage to get that into the box without heating it. Um, and so it takes a little doing, but right now Shin's got it down about 0.2 and he can go up, up to about 0.8 without getting it too hot. And so we're hopeful to study that range initially and try to extract both the thermal conductivity and the shear viscosity independently actually in our latest experiments. So that's the hope. Yep. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Other questions? But also, by the way, we did do a supersonic version and our model, like the, the data started really not fitting the model. So if you translate the periodic potential into the gas above the speed of sound. So the beauty is you have independent control of the periodicity of the perturbation and how fast you translate it. So it's easy to do experiments in the supersonic regime when you want to, you simply translate it in at supersonic speed. And so it's very nice to go from below to above supersonic velocity. And so I'm optimistic that there's some really nice experiments there that will be beyond our ability to measure or to model. And uh, so as soon as we get to it, I'll, I'll pester you. Well, the current model that you have is it's not working there. So there's something. No, it's too yeah. simple. I mean, I think I think first of all, we're trying to do a linear response model, and it starts yeah. like getting out of out of that regime pretty easily when you drive it at supersonic speed. Um, is one problem, and I'm guessing you you prefer the superfluid regime, maybe because you're interested in the macroscopic wave function. Well, yeah, we're still trying to figure out what's happening at low temperature, and and but I think for us to do that experiment, I, I think we can get it that cold again. Okay. And, and do a supersonic experiment for you. We could definitely do a supersonic experiment in the cigar shaped trap. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, you know, so I think um, hopefully we, we can do some good stuff and, uh, and pester you. Yeah. So, are there other questions? I realize I covered just a bit of material. Oh, hang on just a second here. Try that. Sorry, it's somehow the video was turned off. Peter can, oh, yeah, there okay. we go. There go. You guys exist. Yep, I was there. I just couldn't turn on the video. Um, I have one question about this function f that you were using to measure how two operators commutation relation changes. Yes. Um, if we think of it, it, inherently it's a function of time, right? And I think it was the amount of time you let it evolve after the yes. pi over two pulse. Yes. So if we, if we think about it as a function of time, are there any interesting properties? Like, is there any recurrence if you wait long enough? Ah, yeah. So I, I don't know that there's a recurrence, but there's definitely a time scale over which this commutator grows. And so there's, there's, there are well-defined scrambling times that are, you know, there's been a lot of theory on this. Um, and then there's also this funny five variable is a rotation that you're putting in between the two Hamilton. You run it forward in time, rotate it, run it backward in time. 
that rotation screws things up in a well-defined way. And it turns out from just the curvature of the phi dependence, you can learn about things like the Fisher information and just there's all kinds of connections to this stuff. And so we're, we're sort of just amateurs in this. We're just playing. We, we had enough trouble just figuring out how to do the out-of-time correlation experiment. There were a number of subtle details um, in actually making that experiment work. Um, it, it's not completely trivial. It's not totally straightforward. And so for us, it was a big thing just to be able to do this. But I think ultimately you can, you can look at the time scale over which the system scrambles, which is the time scale for this commutator to grow, is one very important measurement for us to make. Uh, and then in energy space, as I mentioned, we're interested in looking at how do two different energy sectors become correlated as a function of time, even for just a simple single pulse experiment, because they're initially just all spin polarized, and then you just let it evolve in this system. And the question is, how does that grow? What does it do? Um, and so there's a lot of nice things to play with with this. Um, but the algebra to derive the commutator relation is pretty simple. It's in the um, it's in the supplementary material of our our latest paper. But I, I think you know, Anna Maria has it somewhere. Um, and it, it's you know we didn't invent it, um, but we we could see a simple way of uh, of doing it. Um, but it, it's quite a nice game. It actually comes from the NMR field originally. Uh, these out of time motor correlation measurements. They're the people who realized you could measure this these coherence coefficients uh, all the way back in the late 80s. Um, they were doing this in NMR systems with, with multiple spins. But Anna Maria was the one, I think, who realized you could translate those techniques to the cold atom field and to the ion field where they have many, many more particles. Um, and so that, that's where that kind of got picked up. learning. And then you have to realize that same model will fit for a single pulse experiment. We can fit the X, Y, and Z components that are very complicated shapes perfectly with no free parameters. So I don't understand how it is that somehow making these coherence measurements is it, it's somehow sensitive to a more strong, a more strongly interacting part of the gas. I don't quite understand why uh, we have to scale it. Uh, and so for us, that's a, a rock we throw at the theorists. Tell us. You know. How are you measuring the scattering length again? So we, may, we measure it in the single pulse experiments. And so we do a, we measure from the, we watch the center of the cloud oscillate. Um, so the central spin density oscillates up and down in time. And you can simply fit the scattering length to make that central spin density right, oscillate right, right. correctly. But then when you do, if you now use that measured scattering length in the spatial profile, the full spatial profile that leads to that central spin density, it fits it beautifully. And so I mean, really, really complicated shapes, more complicated than the ones I showed today, are fit very, very well. But it's a simple pi over two pulse experiment. Let it evolve, make the measurement. And that just works perfectly. So now we take the same exact model the same exact system, essentially the same exact conditions. And the only difference is now we do this, run the Hamiltonian forward and backward and do this angle, this rotation of the whole system in the middle. And when we start looking at these coherence coefficients, it, it doesn't, it, the model needs this bigger scattering length. Like you can't get anything like the complicated shape, the phi dependence without increasing that scattering length. It's always just a simple, cosine looking thing if you don't do that. So we don't, we don't understand why. Um, and what were the errors on the final scattering length that fits? Oh, good question. No, I'm not sure I remember. Um, I, you have to look back it's at the, if you look, if you look kind of, let me, I can maybe make this one big. If you, if you look, I mean, th these are measurements of a few different shots. Well, so, but this is the initial one. And so these error bars are, are coming from the fits to these guys, and we do them a bunch of times. And so some of these error bars are smaller than the dots, but that's you know that's statistical error. Um, and the way we measure where the zero is, the zero here is you see absolutely no you don't see any evolution. So there's mm -hmm. no spin segregation. So we're able to do the best possible measurement of where the zero crossing is 
We actually did that a long time ago, not as well as this. Um, so we, we do pretty well. But again, this is assuming the one dimensional model is valid. Mm -hmm. And then we get this number, which isn't pi. Um, and I should have, I should put an error bar on there and I'm not remembering what it is, but you can see it's, it's perfectly reasonable. And it's at least the right size from a full couple channels calculation, which is a lot harder thing to do. It's five channels. And uh, so, it, you know, totally reasonable, but for our purposes, this is the effective scatter length. It fits the mm -hmm. single pulse stuff perfectly. And so why can't I now take that and do these more complicated pulse sequences and get it to work? But it doesn't. If you want to make, when you do this phi dependent stuff, you, it, the phi dependence can't be predicted without increasing that scattering length. So, I'm, so it's very confusing to me how the model could fit so beautifully in a single pulse regime but yet when you do these complicated rotations, it, it doesn't work. And I, my, my gut feeling is it's because we're looking at actual coherence. When we look at the phi dependence, and when you start looking at higher order coherence, I'm guessing it's caused by the more strongly coupled atoms are somehow favored, but it's favored in a way that's not predicted by our model. So like, is it beyond mean field? I don't know, you know, could it be the fluctuations contribute a lot? The density fluctuations contribute a lot, and you end up with an effectively larger scattering length for you know, that allows you to see these higher order coherence. So I'm not sure, um, and and that's fun. I I like it when we can do an experiment where we nominally can get the shapes right. We kind of believe our data is not garbage, but then we have a a clear issue that we don't understand, which I think makes a nice challenge for the theorists. But we did try a number of different obvious kind of uh, things, and well, we can't figure it out. So it's 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 pretty neat. So, so does that help? Yes. Yeah, it's quite a game. Yeah, it's this thing. If you look at this, I'm talking too much again, but I mean, look at these shapes. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I mean, this is not trivial. This one. Those are not trivial shapes, but the fit up here. Is just a fit. We're just finding these coefficients. We only use we use four four different b values, but then you got four or five values, you know, mm -hmm. and it, and you got a lot of parameters and fits. But then you come down here, and we're fitting this. The only the thing we're doing is cranking up the scattering length. So the fits on the bottom, the mean field fits are are pretty amazingly good to grab the the shapes pretty well. Not perfectly. It's still a little smoother than the data, mm -hmm. but in the data. With error bars this size, some of this could just be the error bar. But obviously, this is a pretty amazing fit. But we have to crank the scattering length up a factor of two and a half. And so I find that kind of amazing. It's, it's appealing, actually, because again, we can't, we can't be measuring junk, but we don't understand why we have to increase that scattering length. And so the question is, what's at work? What's missing? And I don't know. And if you saw the fits that you can do with the one single pulse experiments, we measure the X, Y, and Z components of the spin, and they are very complicated in some cases. We can fit the spatial dependence perfectly with no free parameters. So I don't know what the heck, uh, you know, is going on. So I, I find it, so for me, it's really, really kind of fun. Yeah, thank, thank you very thank much, John, for a fantastic I'm, talk. Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really glad I could have a chance to talk with you guys. And uh, you know, the two of you guys are, are my favorite people here. So I, you know, it's great. You know, you, it's really nice to see you all. And uh, so hopefully we'll be in contact again sometime. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, uh...